morning, God's family. I greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from Him who is and who was and who is to come. Glory to God in the highest and peace to His people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Family of God, our readings for today are from Psalm 31, verses 1 to 5 and 15 and 16. From the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 55 to 60. From 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 2 to 10. And then from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 1 to 14. Listen to the good news of Christ as proclaimed in the Gospel according to St. John. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on you will know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do many greater things than these because I am going to the Father and I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. This is the Gospel of Christ. The passage from John's Gospel we always read at funerals and yet somehow it doesn't speak of, of death as, as much as it speaks of life. The story, this section of John's Gospel begins with chapter 13 when Jesus and the disciples enter the upper room to celebrate the last, the Passover meal, the last supper. He sits with them at table but John introduces that scripture by saying Having loved his own in the world, he will now show them the full extent of his love. The difficulty for the disciples is to understand a God that is different from the one 
they have been taught over many years. Over the years, you brought the sacrifice to God. Now God brings the sacrifice to them and he himself becomes the sacrifice. Over the years, they have been taught that God is the one who is to be served. Now he comes in order to serve them. <coughs> it's not COVID. In order to serve them. So this image of God confuses them. And so as they travel out, as they walk out of the upper room towards the Garden of Gethsemane, the disciples are puzzled. For for them, God lives in a certain place. But Jesus begins to describe God as a presence amongst them. I have been with you, he says, and yet you have not discovered God in me. I have walked with you, you have seen the miracles, and you have not believed. Now he teaches them what I believe to be the most important things in their journey as a community and for us as a church. The first is to discover that the God we serve is the God who came to serve us. That the God we love is the God who loved us first. And so that is described and that is the ultimate sacrifice that John holds in his gospel through the cross and the resurrection. That is the ultimate fullness of God, the full expression of God's love for a broken world and a wounded humanity. Is that God comes to heal us, to serve us, and to be with us. Paul speaks of this love profoundly. Paul says, there is nothing that can separate us from it. In Romans chapter 8, verse 35, Paul asks, who can separate us from the love of God? And then mentions the things that are made or that come as a result of human interference. Verse 35, he says, Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, that speaks of war, it speaks of famine, it speaks of danger that is human created. And the place where we now live under lockdown, the COVID-19 virus didn't fall from the sky, it happened somewhere in a laboratory. So it has, it has human in its origins. But Paul says not even that can separate us from the love of God. And then Paul concludes that in verse 38 of Romans chapter 8. He speaks of the things that's beyond our control. Life and death. Depth and height. And Paul says there is nothing, angels or principalities, that can separate us from the love of God. So the first image that Jesus leaves with his disciples in chapter 14 is an image of the ultimate gift of God's love. Secondly, he reveals to them early in chapter 13 that love came not to be served, but to serve. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Service is more than words. Service is action. Service is sacrifice. And COVID-19 has revealed to us the lack of service in particular as it affects the life of the poor. The poor is scrambling for food and water. <clears throat> How do we maintain social distancing in an informal settlement? These are the services lacking and these give to a world, a skewed expression of the love of God for all God's people. But then, <clears throat> then Jesus brings us to an important word. In spite of the lack that we have, we need to live with the capacity to forgive. The first words from the cross and the last words uttered by Stephen are words of forgiveness. Jesus says, forgive them for they know not what they do. So does Stephen for those who stone him to death. 
Do you remember the whole of chapter 7 is about the life and witness of Stephen. Stephen standing before the Sanhedrin, giving his testimony and his belief in the reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus and that 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 is God's gift to the world and as a result the Sanhedrin sentenced him to death for blasphemy and he is stoned to death. His final words are the words of forgiveness. So we live in spite of where we are. It is so easy for me to condemn the lack of services and yet I need to live with the capacity for those who fail, those who need them most. And we all need to do that. Not to be too harsh in our judgment and too hard in our condemnation. That we must also live with the capacity to forgive. That's the example of Stephen. And into this forgiveness, into this love, and into this service, Peter calls us to grow. In fact, he says, allow God's Spirit to build you up into Christ. And the reality of Christ is love, service, forgiveness. And so I pray that as we continue during this time, as we sit quietly, that we will pray constantly for a greater capacity to forgive, a greater ability to be tolerant, not to be too hard in our judgment, but rather to seek for ways that we can contribute that would make the plight of others lighter. I am grateful for those who have contributed to the appeal that we have made and with that money that we have received, the poorest and the most vulnerable among us will be served. We will find a way to, to bring food to them and if necessary, even water to them. So may God bless you as we continue. Let us remember the example of Jesus, an example of love, an example of forgiveness, an example of service. God bless you now and always. Amen. Now let us conclude. O God, in whose presence live the fullness of the invisible God, of you, Paul writes to the Colossians, he is the visible image of the invisible God. We thank you for your example of love, for your capacity to forgive, for your willingness to be a servant. It is your servanthood that makes you great and makes you Lord and God of all. Thank you for a love that cannot be measured, that knows no boundaries. Into that love draw us, call us, Lord, we pray. For we ask it in your name, Lord Jesus, and for your sake. And now may grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ rest and abide with you and yours now and until we meet again. Amen.